finding finding the harmony that you need to have, an inner harmony, um, to function properly to walk in the spirit. You know, since the descent of, of uh, Adam and and uh, descending in his relationship with God because of the way that's what sin did. So they, people are not in harmony and they wonder what's going on inside of me. Christians so much so, their spirits fighting against their soul, soul against their spirits, they're just not in harmony. I'm trying to figure out what the Lord's saying. I don't know what God is saying to me. I'm trying to figure out what he's saying to me. You know, there's, there's only a couple of different ways you could straighten this out. And that's it. Father, we ask for wisdom. Your wisdom and your understanding, your knowledge. Opening our eyes to see, our hearts to hear. We have ears, we have eyes. Help us see these things, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Now, in the original pattern of creation, man experienced, and I told you before, a descending relationship with God. Adam and Eve descended. It started, it started the day they ate of that tree. And they, you know, I don't care what it would have been. It was something God told them not to do. It was a simple, it was a test. Satan showed up right away, and the test was on. Now, that is, it. God moved upon man's spirit. Listen to these things very carefully. God moved upon man's spirit. Man's spirit moved upon his soul, and his soul directed his body. That's how it worked. The spirit of man that came directly from God related directly to God. Through man's rebellion, however, his spirit, well, it was, it was set aside, and his soul took control of it. They're blended together. Sometimes they look like they're separately. The spirit has different foods that it has to have. You'll, you'll search for it. And that's why people go to witchcraft and worship other things, and things are just fascinating to them. That's spiritual food. It's, it does kill you. It's bad. It's not solical food so much. The soul has its food. But as a result of this, the unregenerated man is controlled by the three functions of his soul, the will of his soul, the will, the intellect, and the emotions. Remember we said in the last teachings of soul, there are three things, I want, I think, I feel. I want, I think, I feel. We had to get past those and surrender, and now we're going into an area where we need to come into harmony. We have to, to be a soldier of God, to be a, a somebody who, who, who can sense the movings of the Lord, where the Lord can come upon you and have you pray. The Lord can tell you things that are going to happen. He can warn you not to go to work today because there's going to be shootings there. Don't do this, don't do that. I've done that in my own home and family, that the Lord will warn us and, and show us and tell us. It's good. It doesn't mean we get it all the time. We don't. But it's good when you do. And not to be in that place of unharmony. Fighting continuously, ramp, ramping and fighting in the home. Kids uh, raising hell everywhere and, uh, between each other. It'll keep your soul in such disarray. Your spirit won't. Uh, you, you can't get any peace there. And if you do, originally it would be through psalms and hymns and singing and enjoying that, but that's about it. Well, how do we go about this the best way? When God reconciles his man to himself, his purpose is to restore the original order of things. That's what he wants to do. By which he once again relates directly to man's spirit. That's what he does. Spirit, spirit. spirit. God's spirit will speak to your spirit. Your spirit will talk to your soul. Man's spirit is, in turn moves upon his own soul, and man's soul moves upon his body. Uh, there's a back and forth in all this. you got to be careful. This explanation of the word of David says this in Psalms 103.1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Through faith, David's spirit had been reunited with God and was eager to worship him. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So... His spirit stirred up his soul. And then you can go the other way around. Your soul could stir your spirit too. There's things I there's sometimes I want to do spiritual things, and my spirit's asleep. He just it just is, and I'll stir it up with my soul to move upon my vocal cords and to utter the appropriate words of worship to the Lord. This is something I've renewed my mind with, and I, this is what I do to get my being stirred. So long as man remains in submission to God and his soul remains in submission to his spirit, man functions in harmony with God. And we're talking about harmony. He's getting harmony within the human being and with himself. Now you could you could turn, there's a lot of people turn to cheese and your body and, and points and, and light points and the new age crap, which is what it is, basically. 
anything that's not of the Bible, anything that's, well, it sounds like this. No, no, the Bible, the Word of God. But if at any time man reasserts his rebellion against God, his soul no longer in submission to his spirit, and the inner harmony is broken right there, gone. He, th now, this means that there is constant tension back and forth. And there is a tension that has to come at times. You will have a tension that will ride there, that you have to ride on that tension between two worlds, actually, this world and the spiritual world. But there should not be that horrible tension there between the spirit and the soul is torn up. The soul wants things so bad I, it walks in the flesh. It's imperative. Now, there are some decisions that, have, that the people make, hard decisions. And, and the soul's playing on The world goes through the soul and just hits them hard. The spirit is from God's spirit. And sometimes that's pretty light, depending on who you are and what you've done in your life, what you've built up. I, I believe in renewing your mind and building up your spirit and educating your spirit through the word of God. It's imperative for God's soldiers, in my opinion, to remain in this harmony, especially have an inner harmony. You need to have inner harmony. The Lord has come upon me and directed me many times when I'm harmonious. I'm quiet. There's a harmony that comes. And it'll be all day, and, and I'll be working and, and doing something. The Spirit will come, will come upon me, want to talk to me, want to discuss things with me. And you could say, well, is that in your ministry? Sometimes, sometimes not. But it, it is between the Lord and I, and I couldn't have that unless... Sometimes people will come to me, and I have this sensing, but I don't know. I have this. They have an inner turmoil because they haven't made up their mind they're going to walk in the Lord. And they're just checking things out. The Greek New Testament has a special adjective that describes action initiated by the soul. That's what David did. That's, that's what I do. It's, uh, people that have learned do this. The word for soul is suki. And the adjective formed from it is sukios. The natural way to render this English would be soulish. But there's many translations, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, the English has not produced such a word as that. So it's, consequently, English translations of the New Testament. And, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I've studied this. They've, they've used a variety of different words to express it. Uh, natural, sensual, worldly, unspiritual, worldly-minded. It, it, is, it is in context without the spirit. And the phrase also falls, to follow their natural instinct. Now, most English readers do not recognize or realize that these seven different words or phrases all translate one and the same Greek word. Period. So it would be in the context of what you're reading that they would translate it that way. But it is in this context. In what I'm teaching you, I'll use this word soulish to define the New Testament word sukus, sukus, or of the soul. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through 46, Paul uses the word three times to point the differences out between our present bodies, which are natural, soulish, the natural soulish and our resurrection bodies which will be spiritual he states this it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and then there is a spiritual body and so it is written the first man Adam became a living being the second Adam became a life giving spirit however the spiritual is not the first but the natural soulish and afterward the spiritual Again, a soulish body is what the translation is. Now, it's one upon which the spirit moves only by working through the soul. Period. A spiritual body is one upon which the spirit moves directly without having to work through the soul. That's interesting. Now, this latter is apparently the kind of body that, that the cherubs have, which are described in the first chapter of Ezekiel, have, having said this, each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go. They didn't have to think about it. They just went. It was directly under the control of the Spirit. Again, wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went because their Spirit went. 
this seems to be the type of body that Paul is saying believers will have after the resurrection. No longer will our spirits have to urge our souls to do anything, to direct our bodies to make appropriate responses to, to what's being said or what we think of what God's doing. Our spirit will be in charge. Our bodies will respond directly to the decisions of our spirit. We will be like um, Ezekiel's cherubs. We'll go directly without turning wherever our spirits will to go. What glorious liberty that will be. And that's pure. We won't have a choice there of ugly. It's not going to be pure. There are three passages of the New Testament that explain more clearly the opposition or tension between the spiritual and the soulish. First Paul says this, But of the natural and soulish man, he does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no mud. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. For the understanding of spiritual things, the soul is dependent upon the spirit. For the understanding of spiritual things, the soul is dependent upon the spirit. So your spirit, it has to have it, or your soul's not going to get it. You can't follow this. It has to be under the direct control of your spirit. The spirit, is, the, 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 the soul won't get it. If the soul is out of harmony with the spirit, the realm of spiritual truth is closed off to it, Period. Now, I'm speaking this from the Word. I'm speaking from experience. How important is it then, therefore, to, particularly for engagement in spiritual battles, that we approach truth with the right attitude, our spiritual submission to our spirit, our soulish submission to our spirit, and our spirits in union with God? Now, how many people can be... Th I've seen this so often when people are in prayer meetings and they're doing spiritual things, and they're, they're lost as a goose in the snowstorm. They are. It's like giving a kid an M16 to get to fire and we're at war and they shoot everybody in the house because they don't know where they're going or where they're shooting. They're blind. They're just acting out. Now, second in his epistles, Jude speaks about people in the church who are they're grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, sensual, soulish persons who cause divisions, not having the Holy Spirit. That's Jude 16 through 19. Now, when the soul of a Christian is not submitted through his spirit to God, let me read that again to you. I'm writing all this down. I'm taking it from many sources. It's nice. When the soul of a Christian is not submitted through his spirit to God, he becomes a channel through which every kind of calamity and carnality and divisions can infiltrate the church. This is true. Underlying causes of division in the body of Christ is, is this, right here. And finally, in James 3.15, the apostle speaks about a form of wisdom that does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, or soulish, and then it's demonic. They're, they're all one the same. This is descending information. James predicts a, a downward slide of these three successive stages from the earthly to the soulish to the demonic. Three of them. Now, when Christians become earthly, they lose the vision of eternity. And trying to talk to them, it's just hard. It's even in that, it's just hard. They cannot see beyond the things of this life. Now, you know Christians like this and teachings of this life. Success, pleasure, wealth, physical health, just this life. They're interested only in what their faith will do for them in this life. You met them. They're not too concerned about people or the rest of going to hell and all the rest of the stuff. Now concerning such people, Paul says this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, only in this life, is this, this is it, we are all men most pitiable. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Christians are like that, often consider themselves prosperous and successful. God considers them pitiable. That's what he said. Paul wrote it. God said it. Now, after that, it's the earthly. The next stage after earthly is soulish. Soulish. To be soulish is to be egotistical, egocentric, self-centered. For such people, the Christian faith 
is a way to get what they want out of life. That's it. They suppose that godliness is a means of gain. 1 Timothy 6.5 The soulish opens the way to the demonic. Now, that's what he was saying. It was a downward slide of three things. This is one of the main ways in which demons infiltrate the church. Right here. The question is often asked, do Christians ever need deliverance from demons? The words of James provide the answer to this. This downward slide from the earthly to the soulish to the demonic exposes both individual believers and whole congregations to the activities of, of demon spirits and the, and the demonic. They, they do. And you should have people that interpret the meetings, interpret the church, not interpreters, but interpret the flow of the spirit in harmony with the spirit. The pastors, the apostles, the prophets in, in meetings and congregations should know exactly what's going on. Sense it. Do it. Now, to restore this harmony inside your person, to, I think to have harmony in a church, the, the pastor has to have harmony, the, the parishioners have to have harmony, the body of Christ, they have to have harmony inside. That's what it means. Are we in harmony? Is your soul under the dominion of your spirit, and your soul under the sway of your spirit, so the Holy Spirit can speak to your soul, your, or speak to your spirit, and your spirit can speak to the, your soul, and your soul can make your body do what it needs to do. People aren't getting divinely healed and talking divine health because their soul's all messed up quite often. The spirit may get it, but it's not being passed through. Now, in many places today, churches have an ungodly mixture. There's no clear sign that's drawn between the spiritual and the soulish. They call themselves charismatic churches and so forth, but the spirit of God's not moving there and they're not doing spiritual things. They're doing religious things and singing and harmony and so forth this sounds beautiful it's entertainment and there is therefore there's no barrier to the demonic at all it can come and go and i've seen even worse than that straight demonic it started out loving and ended up demonically nasty genuine manifestations of the holy spirit are intercepted with the manifestation that are clearly demonic they're inter intermingled interspersed yeah, back and how can you do that? I don't know. They just do. You want to know? Read First Corinthians. It's the, ones, it's the most soulless church in the world. They're doing beautiful spiritual things. Now, as a result, many sincere believers are confused and bewildered by this. They just are. To protect ourselves, we must cultivate scriptural discernment. We must learn to distinguish between what is truly spiritual and what is soulical, soulish. Because the next step is demonic. There's only one instrument. That's sharp enough to do this, to, to make it keen for you. That's the Word of God. We will look further into this as we go along, but it's indispensable, the Word of God. It just is. But for now, it's acknowledged that the Word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and of the spirit and of the joints of moral, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 Now, further on in Hebrews, in Hebrews 5.14, the writer states two conditions that we must fulfill in order to exercise this kind of discernment, period. And I've taught about this several times. That solid food belongs to those who are of full age. You don't give solid food to babies. That's those who, by reason of use and practice, practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil practice. The first condition is that we must rarely feed on solid food. You've got to study the Bible. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Lots and lots and lots of it. Chunks of it. So the study of the whole Bible, not just little parts that you like. Well, the other parts get convict me. Well, well, okay. Then whatever you're being convicted of, quit doing it. The second condition is that we must rarely practice discernment. You have to practice discernment. Read, study, that's the first, second's practice. Live it out. You're not going to know good from evil if you don't lose. I mean, you're gonna, you'll fall down and lose. You'll, you'll, you'll lose. You just will. We must be continually alert, recognizing the spiritual forces that we encounter in every situation, every day. Discernment should be as much a part of Christian soldiers' life as prayer. You're making judgments. You bet I am. And I'm judging and making discernments. Period. 
I led this man to Christ years ago. His family, spirit filled, all of them. And he was uh, a talk executive at IBM. And he'd been to many different seminars on how to control himself, and control his speech, and control the way he thought and did things. And in the process of about a, a year, maybe he called me about six, seven months, and he said, I have said every cuss word in the world that I haven't said in years today come flying out of me. And there's things happening to me right now that are just coming apart, which I had trained up well. And and I, I, I trained I train myself up so I would be this type of person. And they're just, they're, it's just coming undone now. What do I do, Mike? And I told him, I said, everything in your life would have to go through that cross. And I don't know what time they will go through the cross, but it sounds like you have several things going through now of your soul. Your spirit wants to have the power of that, but your soul keeps taking it back. And I said, you can renew your soul too, not just your mind. And you can train your soul. Lovely. And there are many people who do that aren't Christians. And they have read the Bible forward and backwards and they practice it. And they got their soul all cleaned up. And I said, now it's time for your spirit to take the ascendancy. And it will over your soul. And your soul, your spirit and the Holy Spirit will expose your soul to what it is. And he said, oh my God, I don't want this. And I said, submit it to the Lord. Get down on your knees and pray and ask the Lord. These things are happening to me. I know they're soulish. They're demonic. I don't want them. They come flying out of me. I, Lord, I want my soul by your spirit and my spirit to take the ascendancy. And I thank you for doing that. In Jesus' name, and I told him, you can't make this any shorter, but you can sure you make it longer. Submit yourself every second. Everything that comes to rise up, just use the word. And I said, start filling yourself with the word of God. Lots of it. Just eat it. Chug it down. We'll see what happens. It'll be long. And it wasn't too much longer, a month and a half, month. He just said, oh, it's under control with my spirit now. I said, rise it up. I just don't... I don't get mad like that. I won't, those things aren't going to come out of me. That's I don't want that. It's one other thing to watch. Now, we have spiritual bodies, but we're not going to have them till the resurrection at all. We won't get a spiritual body till the resurrection. But for now, by now, however, we, we can, like so many people, and I'm not going to say his name, Prepare for service by remaining submissive to God. Training our souls to stay in submission to our spirits. Now, his spirit, his soul, who would try to take over all the time, just get mad and cuss and swear and be angry. And he said he was looking at women funny now, and he didn't do that for years, and all of a sudden it's all coming out. That's his soul, losing it. Trying to do spiritual things, it can't. Trying to walk by the spirit, and it can't, but it will. Put it down. Finally, Let's, let's, let's obey the exhortion Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. Wash and stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Let's look at a couple of ways we can build character. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 describes, and we just read that, describes the opposition between the spiritual and the soulish. Sometimes it gets rough. If you see soulish aspects in yourself, what's your response? Think about these things yourself. These two conditions of cultivated discernment are feeding on the solid Word of God, studying it, meditating, put it in, and put in what you learn regularly into practice. You will have a chance to do that. Situational ethics will come up every second of the day. What does God's word say? What does God? How are you going to act this way? And discern. This person is speaking of the devil. <laughs> he's, he's earthly, sensual. Why? Because I have the spiritual inside of me. The spirit agrees with the spirit. How can you better meet these conditions? Think about that. Why did David say, Oh, oh Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Because your soul could be down and out and downcast and so forth and so on, but there's another world entirely. The Word of God. Another world. Another world. Completely. How might that prayer of David's help you in harmony? Now, my the best thing I can tell you is don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. That's the only way that I can see through the Word that you can respond to this world. Pray this with me. Father, oh Father God, I speak 
right now out of my heart. I long for my spirit to relate to you directly. Oh, my soul and my body under your submission and under the submission of my spirit. My desire is to walk in the spirit and by the spirit and not the flesh. I don't want to walk in the flesh at least to death and sin. As you work in me, I trust that this will all come about and come to pass. I trust in you by faith. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Yes, and Mike, I'll see you next time.